Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Wealth Management Review with Daniel Krugs and Associates. Uh, the title for today is Progressing Through Uncertainty. So, um, I am Daniel Krug from Daniel Krug and Associates. I am the CEO and Senior Wealth Manager at the firm. And uh, we are a wealth management firm. And just want to put a little note out there for a disclosure. Uh, for this presentation, this presentation is for informational and illustrative purposes only, and obviously is not solicitation. So if you have any questions about uh, what you're seeing today, please give our office a call and we would love to uh, talk over any kind of strategies with you. Now, a little housekeeping. Uh, the duration today is gonna be about 30 minutes for the actual presentation and then uh, we will get into questions and answers at the end. Uh, the session is recorded, so if uh, for some reason you wanna come back to it and take a look at it, uh, we will have it up on our um, YouTube channel. It's Daniel Krugan Associates YouTube, uh, and you can see all the past presentations as well as what we're recording today. Uh, so there will be an email out that will give you a link for today's presentation. Uh, everybody is muted. So um, if you're talking, I'm not going to be able to hear you. So it's okay to talk uh, while I'm doing the presentation. Use the chat room if you have any questions or if you just want to say hi. Now, there is no riddle today. Why is that? Well, because Rocky is on a short vacation with his lovely wife and I am doing solo today. So uh it, it's just me so we um also want to thank cnr for their contribution uh we couldn't do this without them their research is just off the charts uh they have a great grasp of what's going on out there and we rely heavily on them to make sure everything's running well um as far as the information that we we can uh, disseminate out to our clients so for today's agenda, we got some major developments we'll go over. We'll go over the COVID-19 updates. I'm sure you've heard a little news this week. Uh, reopening and unemployment. We'll look at the markets and investing. And then I'm going to highlight another opportunity strategy this week. And then we'll go ahead and on to um, the questions and answers. So again, wealth management, our firm is a full wealth management firm. So uh, like all other advisors, we do get into investment consulting. That's kind of one of the core, core uh, items we look at with investment strategies. Uh, and in that, uh, you know, everybody does it, but there's only about 7%, actually less than 7% that actually do true wealth management. So when you're looking at the true wealth management, that adds the advanced planning. So wealth enhancement strategies, wealth transfer strategies, wealth protection strategies. And like Rocky says, we got about a third of our clients that are uh, charitably inclined. So we have specific charitable giving strategies for our clients. Uh, again, today we're gonna focus more on investment strategy and wealth enhancement. So let's go ahead and move forward. So major developments, the major developments this, this week uh, really come down to uh, a balancing act, you know, trying to open up the economy and stemming the tide of the COVID. So we're, we're watching those numbers. Everybody's watching those numbers. Um, I, you know, again, I think the media hypes things up. Uh, but they always have, right? You know, they're, they're always shooting for the ratings. But let's look at some real numbers, some real facts here. We have about 44 states out of 50 that are not experiencing any kind of concerning changes in the net new average hospitalizations. And keep in mind, the hospitalization is the key, right? Many people will get the flu, they'll get COVID, they'll think they have the flu even, uh, but they'll go through the normal process, won't end up in the hospital. Uh, hospitalization is the key here, you know, keeping the hospitalization low as well as obviously the, the death toll on it, the fatalities. Uh, and speaking of that, you know, we can look at Tokyo, Seoul, Korea, and New York 
to kind of formulate a story and a strategy to see how we can actually battle this. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, consumer spending, that's increasing. It's really helping the economy. We'll look at those numbers. Uh, three of the last five days in the market have been up, although we are seeing some signs of weakening right now in the market. So we're gonna keep an eye on that uh, and see how that plays out relative to our strategies. And treasury rates are near zero, and that's really after a 40 year decline. So we'll discuss that a little bit as well. So that's our major development. So let's go ahead and get into the COVID-19 update. Um, so the numbers, like I said, there is a rise out there. There's a rise in cases of hospitalization, but the fatalities continue to decline. So when you're looking at this graph, the the red or the black excuse me is the hospitalization the dark blue is the new cases the seven day average and then the light blue is the fatalities and as you can see they continue to go down why is that because we're getting a better understanding of how to treat this disease so it, it's it's working in the in the method that they thought it would initially and again, we have to keep in perspective. What was the main focus when we started shutting things down in our country and other countries? It was to not overwhelm our hospitals, our care workers. And I believe we're actually getting to that. So that's why many people are saying we can open back up because the hospitals aren't being overran. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep an eye on that, see how it's working. But when you're looking at the big picture uh, of hospitalizations, this chart has four different categories. The dark green, green is the states that have a negligible hospitalization trend over the last four weeks. Uh, the light green, which is the majority, are states where it's actually going down. Um, the yellow is the moderate increase and then the rapid increases towards the end, the red, which is your Texas, Arizona, Oklahoma, and such. Uh, so what we're seeing though, as a, as a whole, is that these trends are overall going down. Um, we did expect some kind of spike as we were opening up, not necessarily a big one. And you think of the United States and compare them against Europe. And I've said this before, uh, the United States, when you're comparing what can be done, Europe is more of the model to look at because they are governed by the EU, they have a president of the EU, and then they have multiple state countries. Uh, and each one of them can do things a little bit differently, just like our states in the United States. But one of the things that I wanna point out here is that, um, when you're looking at this graph and the different countries what you will find is that, um, say for France, when France opened up, France was really the, the country that did it more seemly from an opening to not having any kind of major research or a re research uh, in, the, in the disease and, and they're doing very well. You look at most of the other countries though, um, you're finding, let's say for Spain, they, they started their opening up process and they had a bit of a surge and then they started getting it under control. Um, same thing was happening with the UK. You know, they, they started opening up, they got a bit of a surge, another surge, and, and then they settled down. So it is not unlike us to be having the same thing happen right now. And again, we're a much bigger country. So as we open up, we're going to see more cases. So I just want to point that out because I want to make sure that everybody's on track, that this thing is getting better, not worse. So uh, this is a chart that Rocky had brought out um, really last week. And it's an interesting chart because at the end of the day, what you're finding here is the, the targeted policies are actually having different, uh, the same outcome. So what do I mean by that? Well, 
MIT did a paper, a study to really determine what kind of uh, lockdowns, what kind of measures need to be taken and what were the results of it. And they looked at it from a financial standpoint and from the, the mortality rate standpoint. So when you're looking at this chart, you have on the, on the left side of the chart, you've got the total lockdown, lengthy total lockdown, and the cost of that is about $8 trillion. That's pretty expensive. Uh, you go all the way over to the right, and now you've got group distancing plus improved testing and isolation of people that have uh, been infected. Well, that cost is about 1.5 trillion, still a lot of money, but nowhere near the 8 trillion. Now, here's the interesting thing that came out of that study. All strategies resulted in a mortality rate of about 0.2%. So, and again, that 0.2% is against people actually catching the virus, not against the population. It's against the people who have caught the virus. So what this is telling us is, you know, if we do the group distancing and improved testing and isolating, we can have the same result, but have the economy actually open up. And that is what um, our current administration is pushing to. Uh, and certainly many of the governors want to get their states opened up again. So, uh, it, it, you know, these studies are very helpful to let us know where we stand. Now, when you're talking about comparisons of mortality rates, and I think, again, I mentioned this last week in the Q&A, but I, I, think it's, I think it's worth further note that one of the things that's conspicuously absent in all of the statistics that we see is the COVID-19 mortality rate against the U.S. population. Um, not sure why they're not showing that, because all other diseases are measured against population, not just against that disease. So when you start comparing the numbers, it, it, it changes the, the look of this disease a little bit. So COVID-19, the disease, you, you measure the mortality rate against the percentage of the US population, it's 0.0385, and these are numbers as of yesterday. Um, you look at heart disease, now this is a number that comes around every single year, that one's a, 0.1992, so closer to a 2% mortality rate. Um, you look at lung cancer strictly from smoking. That's a fully preventable thing to have to, to work on. And I think it's a it's something many people are right now, but we stop smoking. Guess what? That mortality rate drops from 0.1843 from smoking to zero, right? And again, that number comes out every year. And I think last year or 2018's number was 559,000 people died from lung cancer, smoking only. Um, and then you look at type two diabetes, that's a little bit lower. It's half of, well, man, we call it a third of what the COVID is. And that's 0 0.0128. Many, many doctors uh, believe that type two diabetes is actually preventable. Uh, again, it's just a matter of, of taking the, the precautions and the lifestyle change to, to prevent it. So I'm only bringing this out because I think it's a number that most people don't see. And when you start seeing it in, in perspective to other issues that we have, um, this doesn't seem to be as scary. And, and, and that's why we're trying to get this information out. We wanna have logical decisions relative to, to opening up not fearful decisions. Um, my wife has been through counselor training and one of the things she talks about is when people are in fear mode, they just cannot think logically. So we got to get the fear out of the decision making and this is where these facts really help everybody. So um, just a little bit of information there. Now let's go on to reopening and unemployment. So consumer spending, you know, this is really recovering nicely. When you look at where we were pre-COVID, um, we're, we're not that far away. We're about 10% below that, that rate that we were 
spending prior to. Now, keep in mind that as, as we shut things down, that pent up demand was coming in. And I believe we're actually going to surge higher than where we were uh, as, as we open up from a spending standpoint with consumers. So very good news there. There's more evidence of housing market recovery. Uh, again, if you look at this chart, we really bottomed out in April and we had a very nice surge. Again, we're right now about 15, 16% from where we were in December. And again, pent up demand is gonna push that thing forward as long as we continue to open up. And this again is helping the economy. Hiring, however, Hiring has actually slowed down after that rapid partial recovery. Uh, one of the reasons for it, well, there's been a slowdown because of the resurgence of COVID. Uh, states are stepping back from opening up or delaying their, their opening process. Uh, and it's, it's actually hurting the hiring process. So, uh, again, with with everything that's going on with this virus, there is um, collateral damage if we do not open up fast enough. And and again, I do not want to have that overshadow the the disease itself and the death itself that that it's creating. That's it's important that we still move to to uh, reduce that as much as we can. But we we do have a toll that comes in if we don't get this economy opened up fast enough. So uh, just a, a thought on that. So thinking of the economy, when you look at the gross domestic product, the GDP, uh, how long will it take before we get fully recovered? Well, the estimates right now really take us out to Q1 2022, but you can see for um, Q3 and Q4, they're looking at a major jump in the GDP uh, in, in the next two quarters to get us moving, get us rolling. So uh, again, these are estimates. Uh, it appears that all estimates prior to this um, are actually uh, looking better than they were before. So that's a, that's a good sign as we get more information, more data comes in you know, the, the, the projections are going to get more accurate at the same time. Now, let's look at markets and investing. Uh, we go back to the financial speedometers that are put out by City National Rockdale and the equity market conditions. Uh, these are only three of the 20 speedometers that we look at for the economic indicators. But uh, the reality is these are the three important ones right now. Why do I say that? Well, your fear indicator, which indicates you know whether people are exuberant in the market or fearful in the market. Again, that indicator is a contrary indicator. What does that mean? It means that the more red it gets, the more exuberant people get about the market. Uh, the more green it gets, the more fearful people are and the more likely that there's gonna be a pullback. So we are we are looking at this um, if you look at the valuations, again, valuations actually crept up this week. So it's, it's going the wrong direction. But, you know, we'll see what happens as we move forward. Uh, I mentioned earlier on that interest rates are near 0% after the 40-year decline. So most people don't understand this decline has been going on for, for quite some time. Uh, and we're, we're quite close to zero because of what's going on with the COVID crisis and the spending. But uh, there is something that is a silver lining to that, and that is this. Whenever the treasury is low, most come out of treasuries because the investment isn't giving them what they need to produce. Uh, a lot of that money tends to go into the stock market and it tends to go into stock markets that people trust and the U.S. market is that number one market. So uh, as you can see, long term, it looks like that the ability to ride a bull market is certainly uh, trending that direction for us. So when you're looking at returns, and, and, and I'm, I'm looking at this balanced portfolio that people historically have used, 40% uh, bonds, 60% uh, equities, 
you can see the chart below it that it produced a reasonable uh, return over, over time. Um, now, I do want to note the returns that we're showing here are gross returns, meaning that there's no expenses associated with it. There's no uh, fees associated with it. So it is a gross return. You can't get gross returns out of the market because there's always expenses associated with it. Uh, but still impressive numbers. Now, here's the problem. If, if we look forward and we're looking at corporate bond returns, and we've talked about this many times, uh, in the past, they've just worked very, very, very well. However, what are they projecting moving forward? Well, they're, they're projecting a current yield on corporate bonds of about 2%. Well, look at just the 10 year return. It used to be five, now it goes down to two. That is a considerable drop in income for people who are focused on income out of uh, the dividends in, in a bond portfolio. So what is that person to do? Well, at the end of the day, the traditional 60, 40 portfolio isn't going to work like it did in the past. So we've got to make some changes. And this is where moving from let's say a 40, 60, 40 portfolio to a 70, 30 portfolio, and then tactically adding in dividend stocks, you know, in, in dividend stock portfolios, high yield stocks, uh, you can actually pick up some additional return to make up what you lost. Now that does require what? it requires a little bit of risk. So when you look at this chart here, this chart is effectively showing the daily, quarterly, one year, five year, 10 year, and 20 year uh, positive returns versus the negative returns. And what you can see also is the longer you're in a portfolio, the less likely you're gonna have the negative uh, aspect and, and so it's all about time horizon. But when you think about time horizon, most of our clients think long term. They think generationally uh, as well. So, you know, you don't have just a five year horizon. You've got a 10, 15, 20, depending on how long you're going to live, how long your heirs are going to live. If you're really legacy minded, the longer term makes a whole lot more sense when it comes to investing and you end up with much higher returns. So let's go on and look at adding a uncorrelated alternative. Now, this is something we do a lot with our clients. So our, our clients are very familiar with this. If you moved from the 60-40 portfolio, the traditional, and then shift it again, using in the stock market, the stocks with high dividend yield and reducing the bonds and adding life cash value, you can make a significant difference in your returns, plus add additional strategy options down the road as our clients have right now. Uh, so if you think about it, if you add that cash value to the portfolio in a indexed universal life program, you don't add additional risk, you actually reduce the risk. So your standard deviation actually lowers on that portfolio, even though you might have added uh, additional risk relative to the stocks. The overall risk reduces down. Um, think, of it, think of it this way from a return standpoint, um, on this chart, it shows you uh, returns for a different, uh, different asset classes from 2009 to 2019 and what the future long-term forecast is. So your high dividend stocks, emerging markets, uh, high yield bonds, or alternatives, all of them are looking to get reduced because of the way the economy is changing, the market and such. Uh, so your long-term forecast has gone down as well. However, one of the, the categories that has reduced the least is the IUL cash value, that bond alternative that we use for our clients. Again, reduces the risk, but peppers in a higher rate of return uh, 
Um, so the portfolio works better. And might I add also, it adds options for markets that allow us to actually reduce the client's risk even further with the additional strategies like the draw and let heal strategy that we are implementing right now with our clients. Uh, so big deal, it's, it's, a, it's a way to move forward without the additional risk. That's why uh, tactical investing and wealth management is so important to make sure that you're getting the most you can out of your money. Um, when you're looking at the market, it's interesting right now, the market's actually looking past 2020 earnings into next year. Why? You know, they kind of look at this year as a lost year, but they haven't fully priced in what's going to be happening uh, from an earnings standpoint. So the way this chart works here, you've got on the left side, 2019 uh, actual and then 2020 and 2021 estimates. You got the S&P earnings per share and then you've got the earnings price earnings multiple. Well, how, how does this work out to get the implied value of the S&P 500? Well, you multiply, let's say the 2019 uh, 163 number times 20, and that equals out to be your 3231. You go to the estimate for 2020, well, you can see that the earnings per share is significantly lower. So when you multiply it by the price earnings multiple of 20, you can see where the S&P really should be right now. Uh, and that's why most institutional money managers, most economists believe that the market is going to take a correction here uh, sometime soon, you know, relatively soon. And uh, that is the time that we're looking at actually initiating uh, many of the strategies we've got set up right now. Um, so looking at the price earnings ratio, where are we at this point? Well, we've creeped back up again a little bit. The current number is at 22.23. Last week it was in the 21 range. That's because we had a bit of a dip. Uh, and it started coming back again over the last uh, three days. Uh, so it, it's it's moving the wrong direction for the institutional money managers to want to get in. So where are we today? Well, here's the graph again. Um, when you're looking at this graph, and let me kind of point something out here. Uh, when you're looking at this graph, these dots really indicate where the market is leaning. When the dots are on the top of this chart, it means the, the market is kind of pushing to the negative side. Uh, when it's on the bottom side of it, it's, uh, it's pushing to the top side. Uh, as you can see, there's been a, a little more weakness in the market. We haven't seen this much uh, so far in this recovery. We do expect it to happen again. It could very well happen when we have, again, a multitude of, uh, events that occur that push it down, kind of like we've been talking about earnings season and uh, how the news is portraying the recovery from COVID. So uh, big deal right there. It, it lets us uh, kind of see what's going on. Again, the markets are looking at and for a healthy correction of 10 to 15 percent, that drops us into the blue zone, which is actually you know, kind of highlights part of the optimal zone, that green zone, when it comes to executing our strategies. So uh, we, we're ready for it. We're just waiting for the numbers to prove it out right now. So we are moving forward, but there are signs of weakness in the economy. Uh, so we will keep an eye on it as we continue to move forward. So let's talk a little bit about opportunities. You know, again, from a wealth management standpoint, we were, we're really looking at tax mitigation strategies, liquidity planning, uh, everything that goes along with the investment strategies. We've got five of the uh, strategies that we are implementing right now. Uh, so we have got them either set up or we've already activated uh, many of these strategies for our clients. Today, we're gonna highlight strategy number four, which is reallocate risk up. So it's simple, 
but effective. Uh, so when you're looking at the markets again, and, and again, looking at the 10 to 15% healthy correction in this scenario that we're going to look at, uh, we're actually going to use, just like we did last year or last week, a 12.5% correction in this uh, scenario. So how does this play out for our clients? And reallocating risk up. Well, moderate portfolios on the way down you know in other words if you have a moderate portfolio on the way down in a correction and you reallocate that portfolio to a higher risk profile um, and then wait for the market to recover and then once you get to the top again you reallocate back to your regular risk um, now once you reallocate back in this strategy you're now ready for the next correction. And yes, it will come again. We know that there's gonna be more. So let's let's look at some numbers. So we're gonna go back to John. Um, John has an account that grew to $1 million prior to the COVID crisis. And this was basically as of February, 2020. Crisis comes, we have all sorts of volatility going on. His account goes down to 850 and has been coming back to 945. And he's thinking, you know what? If we're going to have this correction, I'm going to do the risk up strategy. And again, what we're looking at here is next on the downturn, uh, we're going to look to reallocate the risk level from his current 3.5 profile to a profile six. So we're going to be ratcheting up in this strategy. Now, in August, the market corrects and bad economic news looms out there. The market drops down 12.5%. John decides, okay, it's time to pull the trigger and reallocate to a higher risk portfolio in his account. So in this situation, the market goes down 12.5. Because he's in a 3.5 portfolio profile, we ultimately didn't go down as far as the market, again, 12.5%. So once we drop and we feel we've hit that, that mark that we want to risk up, we're gonna risk up to a six profile in the portfolio. So let's say we do that in August. Now, the market makes a recovery. The market rallies back 30%. That gets the market back to even, but what happens to John's account? Well, let's say John's account only gets 20%. Well, bringing that account back 20% is going to give him a higher value after the crisis is over. So a 20% increase after a 6% drop actually nets John an increase of over $65,000 in this strategy. So looking at the numbers again, you know, pre-crisis, he was at a 3.5 risk level. The market drops. He doesn't take as much of a drop because he's in a lower risk profile. Uh, he started out with a million dollars. The account went down. He risked up. The market came back. He now has a, a million sixty-five nine sixty, so he gains in that strategy sixty-five thousand nine hundred and sixty. I don't know about you, but that seems to be a good amount of money for that uh, risk uh, that we're working on. And again, when you're looking at risk, the farther the market goes down, the less likely it's to push further down. So the opportunity becomes greater and greater as the market comes down the risk becomes lower and lower because eventually that stock market's going to hit its bottom before moving forward again. That's the risk up strategy. Now let's talk a little bit about while the markets are still up, what have we been doing with the strategies? Well, we have been paying the taxes on any pre-crisis Roth conversions or conversions that were done while the market was going down. Um, I think we've got one more client to pay the taxes on. That part of the strategy is done uh, for right now. Uh, we have also paid up all life insurance premiums that were due during this crisis. Again, when the market went down, we postponed paying the life insurance premiums. Market's back up right now. We're paying them as well as the taxes to get everybody on track again. 
uh, and we'll just watch the market from here. Eventually, the market's going to come back down. There will be life insurance premiums that have to be due at that point. We'll put those on hold, and then we'll repeat that process again when the market comes back up again. So that's our wealth management strategy update for today on the uh, uh, strategies that we're employing, which really brings us to what? Questions and answers. Now, again, Rocky's not here right now. So what's going to happen is Dan's going to try to muddle through uh, trying to get to these chats to see what <laughs> see what type of questions we have. Well, Jim Childers, uh, I, I think he really wanted a a riddle up here, but but that didn't happen, Jim. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, Mike Mike says good morning. Dave says good morning. I, I really do appreciate that from everybody. Uh, like we had said before, um, you know, we just can't wait to get you guys back into the office where we can see you face to face and uh, actually actually try to get back to normal. Um, one of the questions that are on here is, where do we stand relative to the reopening of the office? Well, you know what? I'm here to tell you that I don't know. Well, actually I do, I kind of do. Uh, in, in this scenario, um, I got another delay this week. The floor guys uh, postponed an additional week that set the, the painters back, that set the other guys back. So we just lost another week on, on when we're gonna be opening up. Certainly we're going into a holiday and a lot of these uh, uh, construction guys will take the full week off. So um, actually I think I just lost two weeks on the opening, um, but it's still moving forward and it looks pretty cool and it's gonna be really nice when it's done. So uh, we, can, we cannot wait until, um, until we get everybody back in and you get to see it and we'll have a grand opening and and it's it's going to be pretty neat um so that's really all the questions we have today wow that's awesome um so that being said i am going to uh say goodbye to everybody i hope everybody has a great fourth of july weekend um we're going to take a little time off with our family and go up north and spend some quality time together uh turn off all the media so we can just focus on each other i would kind of recommend that for most people and then we'll be looking forward to coming back uh end of next week to get back in the saddle and start moving forward next week rocky will be doing the uh market recap the overall wealth review uh, so stay tuned for him next week. I'll be on vacation, so uh, he'll be doing it. And uh, everybody, everybody, give him encouragement when he when he gets on. So actually, we do have another question. Uh, they're they're wondering how the response on the survey that we did came out. In other words, the survey we put out was um, relative to what are our clients looking for when we reopen from a protection standpoint so we put a survey out it was really just five questions and uh those five questions gave us an idea so you know how did the survey come out so far well 50 percent of the people um, are not concerned to mildly concerned and then 50% of the people are kind of concerned and really concerned to, to make sure that the measures are being taken to protect everybody. So it, it's interesting. I, I was thinking it was more one third, one third, one third. Uh, it's coming out to be almost 50, 50, which is interesting. Um, now there is a, there is a small margin in the center there that's neutral, but uh, that's how the numbers are coming out. Uh, we're going to, for anybody who has not uh, taken the survey, if you could do so, we're going to continue to send it out to anybody who has not uh, answered the survey until we get all of them back so we can have a good round number uh, to, to be working with relative to the statistics. Uh, and again, we're going to make sure that when you do come to the office or if you would like to just stay with a webinar type uh, situation 
that we are going to follow all measures that you need us to follow to make sure you're safe. Uh, so I just want to put that out there. Um, uh, and, and again, I'm getting a lot of, lot of uh, have a great trip and uh, have a great vacation. And thank you guys very much. And we appreciate that, uh, our family. And we're going to do that. And I hope you guys, again, have a great 4th of July. And I am going to sign off. So bye-bye.